the epistle appointed to be read for this, the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brethren, I, the prisoner of the Lord, exhort you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all humility and meekness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, careful to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, one body and one spirit, even as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and throughout all and in us all, who is blessed forever, amen. And the Holy Gospel is taken from St. Matthew. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At that time, the Pharisees came to Jesus and one of them, a doctor of the law, putting him to the test, asked him, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, and with thy whole mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus questioned them, saying, What do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, David's. He said to them, How then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. If David therefore calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one could answer him a word. Neither did anyone dare from that day forth to ask him any more questions. Thus for this Sunday's Holy Gospel. My beloved people, first of all this morning, um, this past Thursday in the early afternoon, uh, a priest died, Father Francis LeBlanc in Phoenix, Arizona. Most of you do not know Father Francis or know of Father Francis, our Father LeBlanc. Therefore, uh, let us pray for, his, for, the, for the repose of the soul of this very good and worthy priest. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May his soul and all the souls of the faith of the Father with the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. With the passing of Father LeBlanc, another old head has gone to his reward. There are probably, there are very, very few old heads left. When all the old heads are gone, look out, because there'll be nobody left to say, uh-uh, you can't do that. Father LeBlanc was, if anybody was ever strict, 
in the observance of things, you haven't met anybody like Father LeBlanc. It was his word and that was the end of the case was closed as soon as he spoke. So that was that. He was a great man. We had our ups and downs, he and I. Sometimes he'd be up, sometimes we'd be both down. When he was up, you could take, figure on two to three telephone calls every day. We're very close. Beginning tonight, we will recite the Holy Rosary through the month of October here in the church. Uh, we used to go to the shrine, but um, it's now uh, quite dark. Uh, it's nighttime, and there are uh, some of the elders around, and it would be dangerous for us to try to proceed to the uh, to the shrine in the darkness. So therefore, we will have the rosary each night here in this church at 10 minutes after 7. For those of you who simply cannot come, and that's understood, uh, please try, please try to say the rosary somehow during the day or the scheduled hour in your own houses or in your own homes. The uh, All Souls Day envelopes are now in the back of the, in the vestibule of the church. You know how to handle those. Let everyone take these and try to have them back uh, to us uh, before the first day of November so that we can place them on the altar. We again place the uh, prayer cards in the back of the church uh, in case some of you did not pick these up last week. I have received great numbers of grat uh, acts of gratitude for these cards that they are placed so close to our blessed Lord in the tabernacle. And that is as it should be, as we all together, as a family, as a family in love of Christ, that we can uh, be as close as that, that our name, our writing, our handwriting can be so close to him. However, let us not come to the erroneous conclusion that that will be about the principal thing that we have to do. Not so, my dear people. We operate in faith, but we have to shore up that faith with our good, with our good works, and that is our prayer, our penance, our mortification, our sacrifices. And this we have to do. There is no alternative. So those of you who do not have these cards yet, please pick one up and um, uh, get it back to us at your earlier convenience so that we can include those and place them on the altar together. Tomorrow is a very special day. Tomorrow is the Feast of the Guardian Angels. The guardian angels are the protectors of us all. And who is it in this room right here, right now, that is not indebted to the guardian angels? Tomorrow, you make positively certain that you give, we give, something to our guardian angels. Just think of the times that the guardian angel has come down and has act absolutely helped in whatever way you have asked. Don't forget that tomorrow, I beg you. Tuesday is the feast of St. Teresa of Lisieux. St. Teresa of Lisieux and St. Joseph, St. Joseph and St. Teresa, St. Teresa St. Joseph, are the patrons of this church. Many of us speak eloquently of St. Teresa, but how many of us actually follow through with what St. Teresa has to tell us? 
if we truly, truly understand, as we say, we think we do, the word of St. Teresa, then we must follow what she has to say. So let us keep that in mind. Thursday is first Thursday with two uh, holy hours. Friday is first Friday with all day adoration. And Saturday is first Saturday. I am not only gratified, but I am edified very much by your response in picking up the Baltimore Catechisms last Sunday. You took them all. This Sunday we got some more. Take those if you do not, do not already have one. And if those are all taken, we'll get some more. As a matter of fact, we do have some more on order. The difference between a Catholic and a Protestant is this. The Protestant says, faith without good works is sufficient. Well, I think in most cases we can say with certainty that he's mistaken in both of these uh, words. What does the Protestant mean by faith? The Protestant, bless his heart, the Protestant will tell you right quick, nobody can tell me what to believe. If I want to believe this, I believe it. If I don't want to believe it, I don't believe it. But you're not going to tell me what I have to believe. With the Catholic, it's quite different. So the Protestant has no theology. He goes to scripture alone, but according to his own interpretation. The Catholic does have a theology, and being such, having such rather, the Catholic has something to hold on to and to believe and to have, and we must believe. So the catechism has the answer that we need in case it comes up. And it, it is a matter of great freedom when we have something to hold on to and that there's nothing that's left to what I want to believe. No, I don't really have to believe. It's my choice and decision. But if I don't believe, then I have to suffer the price that is required of me for not believing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. I failed to mention that Friday, or Saturday rather, is the Feast of the Holy Rosary. Please remember this, the Holy Rosary, the Blessed Mother of the Holy Rosary. In today's Gospel, again, we meet up with the word love. Master, what shall I do? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole mind, with thy whole body, with thy whole soul. We hear this over and over again every year. And we hear it quite often during the course of the year. And this business of love is constantly, constantly being brought up. Again, we emphasize with all of the emphasis that is required we in no way, no way, indicate that the love that we speak of in here or in our belief, in our believing, is not at all akin to the love that is talked about in the streets. We're talking about two totally different things. The 
there is something I want to put in the bulletin, but I can't do it now for the next several weeks because of other items that have to be there. Incidentally, I apologize that um, we had part one concerning temptation, and part two has had to be put off now for a while because of other things that have to be uh, take precedence. But the love that we talk about, it begins not so much with the love that I have for God. I'm saying, uh, please understand me, keep it in context. It does not begin so much with the love that I have for God, but rather with the love that God has for me. We do not always understand this. We do not always comprehend the quality of love that Almighty God has for me, for you, for each of us. And what he went through and all, the only reason why God created me wherever me happens to be located, whether it is in this church, or whether it is in the jungles, or wherever on earth me might be. There's only one reason that God made me. And that because was because of his love for me. His love for me was so total that he went through all that he had to go through. So total. God did not make me a companion for Lucifer. Under no condition. God made me only, only, only for himself and himself alone. Now, unfortunately, me, wherever I may be, in too many instances and cases, has made a decision. I have made a decision that I do not have to abide by that. God says, that's your choice. That's entirely your choice. I cannot force you to love me. And therefore, me, I, have to suffer the consequences. But God made me for him and his companion to be with him for all eternity. And what does that require of me? That I now, on my part, he has already done his part now it comes for me to do my part. And I have to love him according to the way that he has prescribed. You hear me speak often, or refer often, to our nothingness. Some people are insulted by the use of that word, nothingness. My beloved people, where would any one of us be 
any one of you, myself, anybody, wherever. If the finger of God was not resting all the time, all the time on each of us, what would you be able to accomplish of your own? The trouble with us all today, more than Eddie, has been progressive, actually, since day number one, all the way up to now, this moment, present moment. Each one of us has had the ridiculously ignorant notion that really and truly, I can take care of things myself. I am, after all, in charge of my own destiny. Of course, that's true. I am in charge of my own destiny by the decisions that I make. But I have to make the right decision that my destiny is Him, God, in heaven, and that everything I do, every thought that I have, every vision that I have, every blink of the eye that I have, every movement of the body that I have, everything I do has to be for Him and Him alone. We are going to lengths today that are absolutely unheard of in my lifetime, anyway. I was talking to someone on the yesterday on the phone, and he informed me that practically all of the churches, the Catholic churches of that so-called name, in the Birmingham area, and I, it's not I'm just speaking of Birmingham, but you could be certain that it is not just Birmingham. That all of the Catholic churches now have, I forget, I don't know what they call them, the places for cremated bodies. Little, I forget the name. Oops, vaults. You put your little box in there, shut the door, and that's it. That's it. I was really shocked at hearing that. I'll make it easy for all you blessed people. Don't ever come near me and talk cremation because you'll get your answer right quick in no uncertain terms. But yet elsewhere it is now a common practice where to do we go next so as we love almighty God with all of our mind and heart and soul we must be willing to understand we must be willing to try to understand what he means by this now this is not to take take us away from our daily duties. This has to be understood. You have, first of all, we have to earn, as we have all know, we have to earn our bread by the sweat of our brow, no matter whether it's in the office, in the fields, in the machine, wherever, wherever, wherever. But we have to earn our daily bread. And earning our daily bread demands attending to the earning of that daily bread. And therefore, we have to give the attention appropriate for that obligation and endeavor. But that does not mean that in my process of earning my daily bread that I have to divorce myself from my love 
of my eternal Father. Once upon a time, each one of us, you, were in love. It was not your mind, your minds, consumed with the thought of your beloved. Everywhere you went, everything you did, no matter where, what, how, whatever, the beloved was in your mind, in your mind's eye. Went to bed thinking, got up thinking. That did not prevent you from doing your daily work. So it is now with our work for God, our work for Christ. You do your work as you need to do, but everything you do has to be for him. And we must empty ourselves out completely. There is nothing, absolutely, uh, I can't go into it here because it's too, too lengthy and too detailed and yet so simple. of what Almighty, what our blessed Lord demands of a soul that says, I love you. If you tell God, if you tell Jesus Christ you love him, you can be positively certain. You can be positively certain. I will repeat that. You can be positively certain that he is going to ask you how much. How much? And if we have reserved any of that love, even the smallest particle of that love, for ourselves, he will not be satisfied. And he has every right to that. Again, let us go back for a moment. How much do you and I depend on God for our very existence. And to the amount and to the degree that we depend upon him, to that amount and degree must we love him. By love that we give ourselves completely and totally and absolutely to him. In the Mass, every time the priest says the word, every time he says Mass, he says the word, what have I given to thee for all that you have given to me? Now we can throw all of this aside. We surely can. And we can say, I have my rights. That's your privilege. That's our privilege. We have our, what are our rights? Free will, liberty of conscience, and what else? Yes, those are rights. Some call them inalienable rights. Yes, they are. But when it comes to God Almighty, I have no rights except one. And that is to save my immortal soul, no matter the cost. No matter the cost. And as I've told you before, I said it last week, in the, when we're talking about the catechism, the catechism tells you what we have to do. 
what we have to follow. We have to follow. But the Catechism does not tell us how. And we have to learn how, the how in all of this. What must I do? How can I do it in order to please God? My only purpose, my only purpose must be to please Him, not me. Not me, dearest people. That is what is required of one. And from this point of standing to you, our job is not so much to tell you what we have to do, but to tell you how to do it, to do what? To become saints. It matters nothing to me whether sometimes things are said that might offend. But if the offense does something to help one save his soul, so be it. Count on me to offend. I have no reason to be afraid. And therefore, beloved people, our position is to love God entirely. The world outside today has no use for God. I know you have your contacts. I know that, obviously. But you do not have the type and the kind of contacts that we have all day long from all over the country. Confused people, distorted people, frightened people who have a problem and in today, our own little, our own business that we call traditionalism, which is filled with problems. They go to this one, and they get an answer on a question. They go to another one, and they get another answer to the question. They go to a third one, and they get a third answer to the same question. And they say, who are we supposed to believe? Who are we? Or, or, or who are we to trust? It's very simple. And in so doing, we must also pray that God will give us the grace. You know, we do not really understand how grace operates in us, do we? We think that it might be something that gets painted on us. We have an expression in theology that grace builds on nature. That means the more my nature corresponds with the workings intended for me by my God, the more grace will I be given. And the more it will be the, resplen the, the, res the, the, the splendor of its manifestation in me. And the more I will be able to see, better see and better understand. That's the way grace operates. But let me give you an example of how it operates. In the early morning time of each day, it is black dark outside, isn't it? You can see nothing. Nothing is in front of you except blackness and darkness. Little by little by little, a light begins to come. And little by little, 
I began to see And the light becomes brighter and brighter. And as the light becomes brighter and brighter, I see more and more. When at last, the magnificence and the power of the sun comes and puts glory in everything that I look at. That's what grace does to me. precious and beloved people of God. There is no story devised by man that can equal that one. <laughs>